All right, we got another edition, Dirt and Sprague Overtime. Pretty excited about this one because for the first time ever, a good friend of the show, the former commissioner of college football, according to one Andy Dirt Johnson, and now ESPN's very own Bill Conley is kind enough to join us today. He wrote a great article talking about what the future of realignment can mean for uh, Oregon State, Washington State, given the history of other schools that have had to endure it. And I want to dive back. I want to dive into the article with you, Bill, and thank you for the time. But um, is it a little awkward that we finally like face to face talk to each other? Because it's a weird business where we have you on the phone for years, but we never actually see each other. And we're just phone friends. So thanks for doing this. Is this a little weird for you? Well, I've done enough podcasts now. I'm used to the StreamYard, you know, setup. So it's not the weirdest thing in the world. I, uh, it, it is funny though. I mean, this is, it's been a while, uh, and I had no idea what anybody looked like. <laughs> well, now we know we can put faces with names. It's always fun to do that. I, I'm curious, Bill. I first off, thanks for writing this article because we're in kind of a weird spot here on the West Coast where it's like, Oregon fans are jacked. Hey, Ohio State's coming to town. We're playing Michigan. This is so exciting. And then half of the other fans in the state are like. Are we ever going to matter again? And it feels like there's a lot of national voices that aren't talking about it or writing about it. What was kind of the, the thought of going in of wanting to dive into this topic and put it together from a historical perspective of what it's meant in the past? Well, I know that for, you know, as, as many things that have legitimately changed of late with, <laughs> with NIL and, and player movement and everything, the, the art of roster construction has definitely changed, but it's still... So many of the topics we we talk about day to day are things that we've been arguing about or, or trying to figure out since the 60s, since the 70s. And, um, you know, we were arguing about a playoff in the 60s. We were arguing about, a you know, the, the power schools are going to break away in like 1973. You know, we've, we've been doing this a long time. And so with just thinking about that as my guide, I just wanted to see what it would say. You know, looking back at when the Pac uh, Pacific Coast Conference fell apart and they, after they had shed Montana and Idaho, how did that go? Um, when the Southwest Conference fell apart in the 90s and half of those teams were left behind, how did, you know, what? and just basically, you know, there are 10 teams that have been to some degree left behind the way that Oregon State and Washington State were. And I figured, just averaging that out and seeing what the future held for each of those might tell us something. And I, I do think it told us a little bit of a story. I'm curious, Bill, like diving into something like this, this topic, obviously very time sensitive because of what's going on with those two schools. Yeah. But just your general feel, I mean, I mean you covering the sport a long time. Like we, we go back to the SB nation days and for many that aren't aware, like Bill was killing it at SB nation and creating the SP plus I, I just, what were your first emotional reactions when it was, I think, pretty evident that Oregon State, Washington State were going to be the only two of that conference to basically get booted from its prior existence? Yeah. I mean, when the SEC took uh, Oklahoma and Texas, I, I knew that was potentially really bad news for the remaining teams in the Big 12. But I could at least kind of it, it it allowed Texas and A&M to play again. I'm a Missouri guy, like playing Oklahoma every, every year again. It's awesome. Like I'm, I, that was kind of the one, one of the few things I legitimately missed. And, and so while we tore apart some rivalries, we also put some back together, but this round of the PAC 12 falling apart, put nothing back together, only tore stuff up. We, we got rid of an entire conference based in the Pacific time zone for USC versus Illinois, you know, like Oregon, Ohio state's great, but there are only like five of those games. Everything else is going to be filled out with Oregon Rutgers and whatnot. Yeah. And so that alone was pretty, it was really, really disheartening, but everybody else found a home and you can look at the big 12 and think, I mean, that's, there's going to be like 10 teams in any given year where, that are basically the same that are going to be battling out. It's going to be just a hilarious race every single year. And that's awesome. But then, yeah, like Oregon State and Washington State for the last five, 10 years have, well, five especially, have been better than Arizona, better than Arizona State, better than Colorado, um, better than programs that found a spot. And it just sucks. Like, there, there was no other way to put it. I get that geography still sort of matters in some instances, others not so much. Um, so I understand how it happened. It just, it sucked and it has nothing to do with merit. I I, I realize I'm, 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 in the wrong sport if I like to to root for merit as a whole. But this was a particular example of it does not matter if you're any good. You don't we we've decided you don't bring enough to the table. And so you're in the Mountain West now or whatever. And that just 
yeah, that, that's the exact opposite of what every, everything I want from this sport. Yeah, Bill, but what's your media market size? Okay, we got to go over that first. Priorities here. Who cares <laughs> yeah. if you can actually win and play entertaining football? I, you know, <sighs> you mentioned yeah. it going back a long ways to like the Idaho's and the Montana's and then the more recent examples of like Houston's and TCU's. Oregon State fan is clinging to hope of what the next two years is going to look like. Same with Washington State fan, obviously. Yeah. Maybe the ACC implodes. Maybe there's a Big 12 invite. We'll see how it goes. I'm curious, did you come away more optimistic or pessimistic for the path forward? Because we've seen both examples of Idaho and Montana. Montana's a great program for where they're at. Oregon State doesn't want that. They want no. bigger than that. So did you come away more optimistic or pessimistic about their future? Well, I, I kept reminding myself that we all think we know what's coming here. Super League and this and that or whatever. We don't really know what's coming at all. And so the the one thing that I think this little exercise showed us is that if you just keep organized and make good hires and play good football, you know, things will work out to some degree. Now, Boise State is proof that, you know, if you play at a power conference level, you're not guaranteed to be in a power conference um, because they should have been a long time ago. But th that was kind of the one thing is there, this doesn't mean like the death of Oregon State football or anything like that or Washington State or whatever. It's just, you know, it's it's going to be a little bit of a journey here. And we have no idea what's what's going to happen over the next few years. But but among other things, like the Missouris of the world really benefited from just being good at football at the exact moment that they were good at football. And so that's you know, it's pretty, pretty easy for me to say, but be good at football and this will probably work out okay for you a few years from now. Obviously, if the, if the powers, if the mega powers of the sport separate from everything else, Oregon State's not going to be a part of that, but neither is a lot of this, neither are a lot of the schools in the ACC and the Big 12 and maybe the SEC and Big 10 as well. And so, yeah, just keep your uh, real estate value as high as possible and, and, um, there will still be a chance to play important games, play the teams you want to play, uh, make make enough money to continue doing those things, and then we'll just see what happens after that. Yeah, you know, reading about the Idaho and Montana part of that, and it goes so far back. Um, it, it, you know, you educated me on that, some of that stuff. Like I wasn't as aware with the history of of what they were and what they are now, but. You know, I, I might have said this on the radio show a couple months ago during the season. We could talk about this throughout the season. Was being unsure of the future. And I don't really watch the FCS much. I don't tune into the playoff every year, but I caught some games. And I, I think I had said something effective. You know, the FCS isn't the major level. It's not a national championship on the Bama scale. But those people look happy. Their team's <laughs> really good at that level. Yeah. They're just enjoying the purity of the sport. They show up to the games. And, like, if the worst thing that happens to you, it sucks. It does. I'm an, I'm an alum of that school. If Oregon State's an FCS powerhouse and they're winning national championships at that level, like sometimes we got to find the beauty, even though we're dealt kind of the crap hand. Whereas like Idaho, man, outside of like maybe last year, that that program's right. been as irrelevant as ever. When you look at profiles, I, I was reading the SMU one and I know they're in the ACC now. <laughs> Does Oregon State profile to you more like one of those big city schools in Texas or is it? is like that profile lean a little more Montana, Idaho. -y. Well, it, it does. Um, not definitely not Montana, like Montana. I mean, no, they were part of the Pacific coast conference. They didn't get to play any of the other teams besides like Oregon state and Idaho. Like nobody, it, it was so funny back in the day. It was like, okay, you can be in there. We're not going to play you. We're not, we're definitely not <laughs> going up to Montana, but just like, you know, whatever, play three conference games a year and we're going to play who we want and we'll pretend like we're equals or whatever. And so like the fact that they were ditched, it didn't really impact even their schedule all that much. Uh, but uh, so, it, it, I mean, definitely, we're not talking about a Montana situation. But I did, I do think the exercise showed us that like the teams with upside continue to have upside. Rice is still Rice. Um, it was a really hard spot for them to be in in the Southwest Conference, and it's basically been a really hard spot for them to be in ever since. Uh, but Oregon State, you know. <laughs> It's been a very up and down couple of decades for Oregon State. We've we've seen that that's a program that when they have the arrows pointed in the right direction, at the very least, if you think about a Mountain West kind of situation where they're in it, they're right there at the top in a given year with Boise, uh, maybe a Fresno or whoever. Washington State's been kind of low, lower ceiling but higher floor 08, 09 aside um, for the most part. And, and so – they should be in the upper half of that conference. And yeah, I, the big sky, you mentioned the big sky. That was kind of, I had this revelation back in December and I haven't been able to write about this because it feels like no matter how I talk about it, I'm being patronizing in some way when I'm not trying to be. 
but yeah. you watch those two games that they played in, I think the quarterfinals and semifinals. Or no, it, like the first they played a game that was in a blizzard where they yeah. crushed some team from the South. Um, and it, everybody in that stadium just looked like there was, they, they were the happiest football fans in the world. Then they win a game in overtime after a dramatic punt return in the fourth quarter. Then they win a game after a dramatic punt return in the fourth quarter. Again, it just, it was glorious. And it really does feel like Montana in specific, but really the big sky and maybe the Sun Belt. Those those conferences know themselves more than anybody else in college football. Like we're we we're going to hate our rivals and we're gonna have a blast and we're gonna like put on a good show and everybody else can go make the money and be miserable and buy and and throw out the $25 million ballots. We're just gonna have a good time. And so <laughs> I, I don't like I like I said I, I haven't been able to write about that because I feel like you know I'm telling all, all the non-powers hey be happy with being a middleweight what's so bad about that and it doesn't ever come out right but it was just it was the coolest thing like they know what they want out of their college football life and they go and they get it it was a good reminder of like the 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 pure sense of college football yeah. away from the big business and the NIL deals and the transfer portal and all the chaos that happens. It's like, Oh, that's right. These guys are just playing for the love of the game. And it's a fun you know, product. And you mentioned hating your rivals and all that. We're all excited about a civil war and 90 degree weather in September. I'm sure that will be normal. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I, you know, I, who knows on this bill and I even hate asking it, but I'm just curious because you're so plugged into this sport. Nobody knows where the future is going to go. If you're an Oregon state fan, is the storyline of following anything big 12 related more important to you or, ACC, hey, you know, Florida State, Clemson win a lawsuit. They get the hell out of there. ACC's panicking. Like, what? what's the pathway you think that you would be following more closely, I guess, if you're an Oregon State fan? I mean, I do think the Big 12 is kind of a wild card just from the perspective of they seem to be willing to create like a 32-team conference if the if the dynamics are right. Um, they're, they're willing to take a big swing. And I think they've already taken one. We'll, we'll just – I don't know. I, I can't tell like what a timeline on that would be. Obviously, the next step here is the revenue sharing aspect and who does that and you know what groups that forms and all that. That's kind of probably the next step. I don't see the Big 12 doing anything before then. But I mean, in, in the shortest of short terms, if this does end up, I realize they're holding on to the, the Pac-12 name and everything and maybe they we we end up with a Pac-12 that looks a lot like Mountain West but says Pac-12 still. I don't know. Um that's not going to be a power conference, but it's going to be a conference Oregon State could win and put themselves in position for the playoff and Washington State as well. And that's life right now. You know, you're going to play a bunch of peers that you don't necessarily want to consider equals. You're going to be better than more, uh, most of them, uh, mm -hmm. you know, more than you're not. And uh, you're going to go try to win a conference and 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 pull off a playoff bid, and and maybe that's pretty decent living in the short term. And you know when everybody when when there's a big breakdown and suddenly only the teams that can pay 15 million a year to their football players end up in this other level. If you think you can do that, you join them, and then we see how the chips fall. But I think, like I said, my main recommendation is just be good at football, and and that'll yeah. solve a few of the problems. You know, in in. The Super League thing gets brought up a couple weeks back. And if I was to take Bill, because I don't know, I felt like people were kind of nitpicking it of like logistics. Why is this team play that team? And I'm like, right. that's to me as an Oregon that's State fan, that's not yeah. the important thing. It's like, <laughs> is there a world where you get, I what was the number, 70 teams, whatever that was, and you keep them in there and you relegate the bottom 10 and you basically turn back into the Pac-10, like as an Oregon State fan, that was something that I loved. Now, the equity part of this, the private equity of college football, the SEC, the Big Ten, not wanting to put the genie back in the bottle with money. Is there a world for you? Or did you like that Super League concept? Maybe not agree with all the divisions and whatnot, but the idea of what it was. And can you put the genie back in? Do we get to a place where like, you know, TV-wise, it's better if we actually create something like this and then hammer out details that matter. Yeah, the, the divisions themselves, it was really hard to move past that because they were so horrible. Um, yeah, like they yeah. put the Pac-10 back together and everything else was just stupid. You had like <laughs> BYU and Wisconsin in the Plains division. And as a Missouri guy, Missouri ends up in, the, in a conference with nobody they've ever been in the conference with. Um, yeah. It was just, it was really bad. And I started thinking about how much somebody got paid to put that together and it made me kind of, angry but the, the main <laughs> problem with it besides the the specifics was the sec and big 10 have no uh, no reason to uh, agree to any of that whatsoever as far as they're concerned right now they have 
their super league, right? Like they're making, especially since they, you know, strong armed everybody into giving them a higher percentage of the, the new playoff money. We could have used that new playoff money to pay for basically all FBS athletes to make however many thousand dollars a year. And instead we're just going to give it all to the big 10 and the PAC 12 and the mountain West makes like 100,000 more per team or whatever, 200,000. Um, it was the worst possible outcome in that regard, but they have what they want. They're going to make all the money. They have all the brands. They're going to get probably eight out of 12 teams in a given playoff. They don't need any of it to change. So the only way it changes in, at that level, the only way that we, we get a Super League thing, I think, is if we invite the vampire of private equity in the house uh, and they just, you know, suddenly we can't control the, the private equity anymore and they're offering, you know, 20 teams a billion dollars each a year to go play football or something. That's going to that, that's the only way I would see something like that happening, because right now the Big Ten and SEC just have what they want and they don't need anything else to change. Um and well, I don't know. Maybe they do. Maybe they just want more money, <laughs> and, and therefore, like I, I don't know. Like at some point, you just you know this. It, it reminds me of the the German st- soccer games I went to in February. Like where ba- they were basically asking, that, "How much money do you need?" Like we don't need this private equity money. We're doing okay. Right. And right. Yeah. I don't know if uh, in America and sports we have a limit in that regard. Yeah. When is enough enough? Usually the answer is, is never, never. I, you know, yeah. we, we love following the S and P plus all year and seeing kind of where teams slot in and using it to, you know, you know, for our own selfish purposes, gambling mm-hmm. angles on Fridays on the show, as we kind of get ready for Saturday, how the, the sport is in utter chaos right now. And we have thousands of players in the portal. It feels like it's new teams all across the country, <laughs> even for Oregon, a team who has recruited really well. I know I look at them and I'm like, yeah, there's like 12 new transfers who are all in the starting lineup. How does, how, how how does all the chaos impact the S and P plus and how much more difficult is it to put it together if at all now than maybe it was five or six years ago? Yeah. I mean, I, we're, we're still in the early period here, but I've at least got a couple of years um, of data now with like the heavy, heavy, heavy transfer loads. And yeah, I mean, I think I figured out like the whole idea of returning production is a big part of it. It's not necessarily returning. It's just like, how much production from last year do you have <laughs> right. on your team, basically? But that still tells us a story, and it still seems relatively predictive overall. So, you know, putting extra emphasis on that, extra emphasis on the recruiting rankings of those transfers, I think I'm in a, a relatively decent spot. Like last year's projections did okay. Like, I, it, you know, it whiffed on some, and, and that's always going to happen. But it nailed Colorado which I thought was very, that, that was the team I really wanted to hit last year. And, and it, that gave me some confidence uh, that you can't just game SP plus by just adding so many transfers that it can't keep up. So it seems like- Were I you nervous a, at first though? Were you nervous oh, yeah, at first? Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah like, I mean, even though I knew those first few games were lucky and we were all thrilled by that Colorado State game and I'm thinking, Colorado State's terrible. Like they barely beat a terrible team. Why are we so excited? It was still yeah. like, you had this, you know, anytime- Every game that SP Plus misses, I get a little pit in my stomach because I just hate it. I want it to nail every single game. But um, no, I mean, overall, it did okay. And and I think, you know, just looking at the projections, I, I we'll have them up in like a week and a half, I think. That seems like enough time for most of the commitments to roll in here from the spring. Um, like, I think just looking at the list, I'm like, yeah, that all that all tracks at least. Yeah. And, and I, I'm not seeing a bunch of crazy results in there. Um, and so I think it's going okay. It's just different. And, and things like returning production and recruiting rankings mean something different now than they used to. Would Oregon winning the national championship this year surprise you or you'd go, okay, they did take that step. I think, well, at this point, anybody other than Georgia or Ohio State would be a little bit of a surprise to me, but we are, 12-team playoff is a real tournament and with it, with, that'll have real upsets and maybe open doors for people. But I would absolutely put Oregon right in that kind of cruiserweight class, I guess. If, if Georgia and Ohio State are right up top, then it's Oregon, it's Texas. Uh, Michigan and Alabama are mysteries, but they're probably still up there somewhere. That's, those are kind of like that second or 1A tier of favorites even. Uh, but I would at least like Georgia and Ohio State are still ahead, I think. How does the rest of the Big Ten look in your mind? I, we all know Ohio State's number one for a lot of folks and then Oregon's hoping to be in that same category. And for some, they are. It just it seems like a big question mark after that. You mentioned Michigan, a lot of talent, but just a new quarterback, new head coach who I know won some games last year. Franklin always seems to underwhelm offensively at Penn State, USC's in, in an overhaul. Like, how do you feel about the rest of that conference and the way that it shakes out? 
Yeah, Penn State's in a funny place where they only lose to top ten teams, and we act like they stink. Uh, right. But they never beat. They haven't beaten one of those top ten teams in a while either, I guess. And so it becomes that thing. Um, yeah, like right now, if I put out SP Plus, I just pulled it up. If I put out SP Plus today, Ohio State would be second, Oregon third, Michigan sixth, Penn State eighth. And then a humongous drop into the 20s mm. where you've got USC, Iowa, UCLA, Wisconsin, Washington, maybe a Maryland in the in, in the 30s or 40s. Mitt Nebraska's in there somewhere. But it is a very – this has always been a very top-heavy conference. Um, there's always a, some pretty impressive dead weight in the Big Ten. Uh, <laughs> and basically with what they just added, you've got more in that top tier, you got more in the second tier, and you've still got a lot of dead weight at the bottom. So I yeah. do think it's um, – if Ohio State, if for whatever reason that offense just doesn't click back into kind of a top five level or whatever, I guess it might not matter because that defense should be really good. But if they're not the best team, then I do think Oregon's probably second in line. And I'd really be surprised if it's anybody other than Oregon, Michigan, or Penn State. If I unplug SP Plus and then I ask Bill Conley, college football <laughs> fan slash writer, what is Bill Conley most looking forward to about the season? Is there a narrative, a conference theme? Is there a team? Like, what is it for you just individually that gets you jacked? Because, I mean, it's it's May. We're taping this in May. I, we're already talking about college football on our show, and the NBA playoffs and Stanley Cup playoffs are happening. We're, we're jonesing for it. What is Bill Conley most looking forward to in the next couple months? Why do you think um... – well, I mean, I, I mentioned the Big 12. I mean, it is hilarious looking at – sorry to refer to my rankings again, but it is something I've been thinking about for a while. Right now you've got Utah 17, Kansas State 18, Arizona 19, Oklahoma State 20, Iowa State 25, Kansas TCU and West Virginia are pretty close. Texas Tech and UCF are relatively close. There's like 10 teams that could win that conference. And so just from a week-to-week -week entertainment standpoint, that is going to be an absolute mess um, of a good kind. And so I am looking forward to that. Um, I'm looking forward to some big sky football, to be honest, but yes. I mean, I, I do like, we have some novelty games there at the start. We're going to throw Oregon, Ohio state right out there and, and make a huge deal out of it. And, and lots of those types of pairings and it'll be kind of interesting, but I, I, I am still struggling. Like last year was such a perfect playoff race or would have been a perfect playoff race in a 12 team era, especially where every conference had a really interesting story going. But then you look back and like eight of the top 10 teams from last year are in two conferences and half of those teams won't be involved in the conference race. And that kind of sucks. I'm not quite, I haven't, that, that part's not going to be quite as fun. It is like, the, I was looking forward to an expanded playoff, meaning that conference title races matter more and they will like big 12 ACC, but we also took some of the fun out of those conference races at the same time. And so still getting used to that apart. Well, and then on that note of the 12 team playoff too, it's going to be so crazy to watch as the year goes on, how that race does unfold. But I heard the, the report a couple of week or two ago where they're talking about they, they want to avoid rematches potentially early in the rounds. They want to seed people in a certain way. Like how much trust do you have that year one? I, we're, we're going to freak out no matter what, right? <laughs> 11 and 12, we're going to yell and scream. And we had undefeated Florida state last year, but just where, where's your faith in the powers that be to not do something that, a lot of people not in the Big Ten and SEC fear is just going to be you're cooking the books for your schools to give them favorable matchups and get all the spots. Yeah, I um, I don't definitely don't think the committee is any better at this than like a BCS formula would have been. And you could, and I, and I think that's one of the things like with the NCAA tournament, they put in rules. They don't ask the committee to rank teams, but maybe manipulate it a little bit. If, it, if, if we can avoid a rematch, they just basically say like, you know, conference mates can't meet in the first round or whatever they, you know, they have rules in place for that. And that sounds pretty good. Like it for those first round ma matchups, just say, you know, flip 11 and 12. Don't, don't make the, the committee do it automatically. Just like flip it after the fact so we understand the rules behind it. I would prefer yeah. that instead of just, well, 10 and 11, we'll just kind of like the, what was it a couple of years ago, uh, avoiding the Ohio State Michigan rematch. Like, yes. We all knew TCU was going to finish third, even though they were probably otherwise going to be fourth. Um, that, that was still just like make it open and honest and, and, and we'll figure it out. I, I do appreciate that they're, margin for error i guess is better now like they're not they're picking 12 we're, we'll get mad about whoever was left out because they're guaranteed to have basically the same resume as the last team in um and if it's consistently a big 12 or acc team that gets left out for a nine and three sec team we'll certainly notice that too but it, it, the bar is low there the, an 11 seed's going to win the tournament like one percent of the time so uh, we'll at least <laughs> right. get like the top names 
right or more right. And that's that's literally something, I think. Uh, well, don't worry. Mike Riley will ride his bike to the committee meetings and set everything straight <laughs> this year. That'll change uh, for the better. Gary Pinkle. Uh, Gary Pinkle's on there, too. So That's you know. right. Yeah. Yeah. Hurry. Hey, before you, you get go. your last one in Sprig, I want to squeeze one more yeah. in here because I you, you were saying something there that I thought it was interesting. I and Sprague and I have debated this as well on our show. Like this, this kind of went into the Florida State Alabama thing. We don't need to get into that mm. again about undefeated or one loss. But I do think we're heading for an interesting conundrum going forward. Of use Florida's schedule as an example. Florida has the most insane schedule of all time, and yeah. we're going to grade them on a similar schedule or a, a similar scale as somebody maybe from the Big 12 who has one top 25 matchup all season. Like, how how do you balance, do you think, going forward, the team who is maybe 9-3 and three in the SEC, but their losses were to Alabama, Georgia, and maybe a top 10 Ole Miss, as opposed to a one-loss non-Big 12 champ, but they only have, you know, two quality opponents all yeah. year. Like, how, tracking that, I think, is going to be really challenging. Just how, how do you feel about that and the outrage that is definitely going to ensue? <laughs> That is an area where computers really can deliver some level of objectivity to to, to the proceedings. Um, that was, you know, we I, we we remember the BCS days where every single time the humans disagreed with the computer part, they changed the computer part. Like we've <laughs> always we've never done that part right. But I appreciated that their computers were in there because it was just a way of like I said, just setting up rules, however the algorithms do it, it was just setting up rules and we couldn't manipulate it afterward. It was just, it was what it was. And I appreciated that because uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, a, I, I, I shouldn't, you know, uh, bring Missouri into this, but Missouri's <laughs> schedule is like barely top 50 this year. This is the easiest schedule they're ever going to have in the sec. And it's perfectly timed for them because if they go 10 and two, they're in no matter what, right, uh, but right. I'm very, if they go nine and three and we're saying, well, they're nine and three in the sec. Like, yeah, they were like the best big 12 schedule is pretty close to what they're playing this year. Um, because the, the range is really big, but if Florida goes nine and three, they should absolutely be in there right. because they play every good team in the conference. So, yeah, I mean, that's when you have enormous conferences, you have potentially some really wide ranges of schedule strength too. And I do kind of worry that we're just going to all, even though it would benefit my team this year, it just generally speaking, <laughs> it, it, we're going to say they played an SEC schedule and that can mean a lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 27 minutes, man. I, I can't thank you enough. <laughs> Bill Conley wrote a great piece, What Happens When Realignment Hits, and he gives some great examples way back in the history of college football to the more modern-day versions of teams that lost their home but found a new one. So hopefully that leaves some optimism for Oregon State and Washington State. I can only speak for myself here, Bill. I have never given up on you as the commissioner. My co-host ditched you the minute Josh <laughs> Pate said hi to him. I think that's because of the white T-shirt and the big arms, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Uh, thank no, you Conway's for hopping a beard on. Guy, though. He might be back in the running. He might be back on top. <laughs> thank I, you I, for I, I'm on just me. happy to be, to be considered. That's uh, I'm happy to be uh, nominated. All right. Thanks a lot for hopping on, Bill. We appreciate it. Take care.